Go ahead and get started. Can you hear me? Welcome to Great Decisions 2023, our second week. Um, we are going to be discussing China and the US. I say we. Rick is going to be discussing China and the United States. First, I would like to thank the Franklin Public Library Foundation for financing Great Decisions. Um, with help from the Jerome J. and Dorothy H. Wolfs Family Foundation and Carol and Tom Donovan, our major sponsors. So I'll introduce our speaker, Richard Rockamora. He's a former vi vice president and general manager of Cooper Power Systems in Shanghai, China. During his time in China, Richard and his wife, Joan, studied Chinese language, history and culture, and traveled all over China. He is a lecturer for the School of Continuing Education at UW-Milwaukee. This is his second appearance at Franklin Public Library's Great Decisions Discussion Series. In 2021, Mr. Rockamore spoke on the topic of China and Africa. So I'll turn it over to him. Thank you, Jennifer. Can everybody hear me? Yes. yes. Wan Shang Hao. That means good evening in Chinese. And uh, thank you for coming tonight. This is my wife, Joan. She's here to make sure I don't tell any too many big lies. <laughs> so you can, she'll fact check me if you have any questions. Also, I'd like to acknowledge my friend uh, Dennis Walder and his wife, Jan. Dennis, when I was in China, Dennis was in South Milwaukee supporting me. A lot of things we were trying to do with Cooper Power Systems. And a couple of you, has anybody been to China here? I think. One, two, three, three of you have been to China. Okay, well, Joan and I were uh, Cooper Power in 2000. I first started visiting China in 1995, and it was, things were pretty rough, uh, and then the economy was terrible, and facilities were poor. It was really, if you got out of the big cities, it was really pretty, pretty primitive. Um, changed a lot over the years, and in 2005, our, our boss, said to me, we'd like you to go to China for one to three years. And so we did, and uh, we, 10 years later, we came back in 2015. So we lived there for 10 years. It was really interesting, and we went, we got to know the Chinese people, learned a little bit of the language, and learned a little bit of our way around China, and did a little business, and they paid us to do a lot of sightseeing and a little business. So we had, a, we had an interesting experience and a great time, and it was an interesting time to be in China, especially to watch all the cha changes. I was a China watcher since high school, and uh, I guess I still am. Um, so I'm pleased to be uh, invited tonight to talk about uh, the Great Decisions uh, briefing book article on China. This is the book over here. I don't know if you have a copy or a chance to read the article. Yep. So there, there are eight uh, uh, topics in the book, and they're, they're, every year the, the Foreign Policy Association Prince a new edition uh, of the latest topics. And this one, this topic is really, every year I think it's the hottest topic going, but this year I think it's even hotter. So as I was preparing this presentation, I was really struck by how how many changes there's been, especially in the last six months and, and even the last three months, the accelerating rate of change in our relationship and the, the deterioration in the, in the relationship between the United States and China. I really thought it was quite worrisome. I was adding slides. I started, I started working on this a couple weeks ago, and I was adding slides as I went, and adding slides all the way through this weekend. As you can imagine, these things are changing quickly. And I think it's really it's really concerning, at least to me. So let's go through the uh, through the uh, the presentation tonight. The, the book starts with uh, talking about the uh, competition analogies. This is what the author talks about. The author from John Hopkins University. He's emeritus. And there's a big international department there. And he uh, makes the analogy that I was a little startled by. First, he talks about spheres of influence. He talks about the Monroe Doctrine. It's a sphere of influence is a term that's used in international relations. And, and start, President Monroe, in around, I think it was 1820, declared the Monroe doc, Doctrine, which said that the uh, Caribbean was a, an American lake and the European powers should stay out, stay out and not intervene in the affairs of nations in the Caribbean. Well, the concept of sphere of influence is very much in foreign policy, and this is one of the potential clashes between the United States and China. 
The second analogy he made, which I was even more startled by, wasn't so startled by the sphere of influence uh, analogy, but it was the analogy to the Cold War, suggesting that we had entered a new Cold War with China. Maybe we have. And, and uh, he, he, he was very worried about uh, China aligning with Russia, which I, I was a little puzzled by, that this was gonna be a really pretty scary situation for the United States. Not, it's not, a, not that it's not a scary situation, but it wasn't so concerned with the Russian angle. I'm not sure when he actually wrote the article, but that's the book, it's about, about eight or 10 pages. It's, and the article's very good, I'd recommend it to you if you have time to read it. But when we talk about spheres of influence, one of the uh, maps that I, I want to put up here is, is a sphere of influence that he didn't talk about, the spheres of influence in China in 2010. I don't know if you're aware of it, but China was carved up by the European and Japanese powers at the end of the 19th century and in, into the 20th century and, and into spheres of influence. So for example, the North area here was the sphere of influence of Russia, eventually displaced later by the Japanese, which led to World War II. Um, this area, the green area, this, the green area here was under the, the Yangtze River, Changjiang, which is the Chinese name for Yangtze River, and, and Tibet, and Nepal, they were all under spheres of influence by the British. And of course, southern China, the area around Hong Kong, Guangzhou, that was also the British sphere of influence. And the French were in the south, and down here, and, and uh, the Japanese were here, the Germans were here, you heard of Qingdao beer. Uh, there's a city called Qingdao, and that's where all that beer comes from. It's still there, they're still brewing it. It's the beer capital of China, and uh, great beer festivals. So these are the spheres, this is the concept of spheres of influence. And the Chinese talk about this as the carving up of China. This is a pic, this cartoon is from a picture I took in the Shanghai Museum. This is a cartoon showing the role of the rulers at the time, uh, Queen Victoria, the Kaiser, the French, the Japanese, all carving up China. The Chinese refer to this period of time as a century of humiliation. This is an important concept to understand if you want to understand how Chinese people think. 1842 was the first opium war. There were two opium wars where the British uh, forced the Chinese to open up their ports. We call it the opening of China. Well, at least when I was in high school, that's what it was referred to. But the Chinese referred to these as, as the beginning of a century of humiliation where the foreign powers carved up China they pushed opium sales in China. Something like 20 or 30% of the population was addicted to opium. It was a pretty serious issue. And, and they're very angry about the, this, this century of humiliation, which in their eyes did not end until World War II in 1945. So 1840 to 1945, the Chinese teach their children about the century of humiliation, and they gotta get it back. So they have a motivation to, to uh, restore China make China, to borrow an analogy, to make China great again and, and get, re, get this back. Uh, and this, the first step in this, uh, getting Chinese people in charge of China was the completion of the Chinese Civil War when the, the uh, Communist Army defeated the Nationalist Army and in 1949 drove the Nationalists from the mainland of China to this little island in this, here off the coast of China about 100 miles off the coast of China, called Taiwan. And, and that's still controlled by the nationalists. So the Civil War has never been completely resolved. Um, but this was the beginning of uh, putting China under Chinese under Chinese control. It was very nationalistic. And Mao Zedong, the chairman of the Communist Party, stood in Beijing in Tiananmen Square and declared that's what the, that the Chinese people have stood up. And that's what those characters at the top mean. The Chinese uh, people have stood up. That means stood up to the foreign intervention in China. That's what they're talking about. So you're seeing a nationalism drive to uh, fix things that were, to fix wrongs that they are very bitter about. Uh, this is October 1st, is still a holiday in China. The first week of, of October is a, a golden week, much like our 4th of July. We loved it because we, we got the week off from work. Um, so, so in the process, uh, Mao declared a sphere of influence in the in the uh, in the east east of China, the far west Pacific, our far west Pacific, his Near East Pacific, that this was their sphere of influence. All this water, 
but at this time they really had no way of enforcing it. So from about 1949 until the 1970s, uh, China became very introverted. There was really very little involvement with the rest of the world, and it really left our story. You know, we hear about the evils of Red China and all that stuff, but really, if you think back in the big picture, it was not really a big challenge for the United States at this period of time. They were focused on consolidating their control in China and, uh, and fixing their economy. In the process, they destroyed their economy. But we don't have time to go into what happened to China during this period. But um, this sphere of influence is where the potential conflict that the author is referring to in the book. Where is my pointer? There it is. So this is this is the area that's being contested. And you notice that Taiwan is in the sphere of influence because they, from their point of view, this, their civil war has not been completed because the opponents still control Taiwan. And the only reason they're able to survive there is because we support them. So there are three big, the big differences from the Cold War that we all grew up with, the Cold War between Russia and the United States, which was roughly from 1948 to uh, 1989, and the book talks about these. The first is the trade interdependence between the United States and China. We had no trade between Russia and the United States, essentially no trade. I think we sold them wheat at times when they had crop failures. But you can see here that China uh, is, is we're, we're buying $450 billion of goods from China at the end of 2019, despite all our tariffs and everything. And we're selling to them about a, a little over $100 billion of goods into China at that time. So that's where the results and what you, what you read about is the, the big trade deficit. But the point is that China, we're China's largest customer and they're, they're our largest supplier. So we're very interdependent, which we were not during the Cold War between Russia and the United States. Second thing is that during the Cold War between Russia and the United States, there were only really two nuclear powers, the United States and Russia. And now there are multiple people with nuclear capability around the world. Multiple, proliferation of nuclear weapons is very disconcerting. So it's a much more complex situation than just, uh, it's not a bipolar world like it was long ago in this so-called new Cold War. And finally, uh, we all are concerned about climate change, including the Chinese are very concerned about climate change. They have as much or more at stake than we do uh, with the climate. And so we're gonna have to work together to fix it. The United States and China are the two uh, biggest greenhouse emitters in the world. So we have shared interest in trying to fix this. So these are differences from the, lab, from the Cold War. So this is some of the issues with maybe how valid this comparison really is. The book goes on, this graph is right out of the book. And, it, and the top slide shows US military spending. Uh, and in, in 2012, we spent, our country spent $760 billion on military armaments. That's for everything from defending Ukraine to keeping China under control. The Chinese have been rapidly escalating their spending. And where are we? Anyway, you can see that on the bottom graph. And they're, they last, in, in 2022, they spent 240 billion, about a third of what we spent. So they're spending a lot, but not nearly as much as we're spending. Of course, all their spending is focused on us, and we're focused also on containing the Russians and basically maintaining the post-war American empire. That's really the way I look at it. Um, here's another graph, this is from the Financial Times, this is 2018, this shows the percent of military spend expenditures in the world, and this first chart, here we go, this shows the American spending, the Australia, South Korea spending, and the NATO spending, and look how much we're spending, almost 60% of the total spending on military hardware in the, in the world by our, our side, and the Chinese are spending less than 20%. But nevertheless, it's very focused spending, focused on our, our, our vulnerabilities and weak, weaknesses. So this gives you a little perspective on the, on the competition. But the interesting thing, point I want to make in the book that the author didn't bring out in the paper, look how small the Russian spending is compared to everybody else. Russia's really, makes, they, they get a lot of attention for really a pretty small economy, mainly because they have a very strong nuclear arsenal really actually a pretty weak country when you look at this. Um, when you look at the world nuclear forces, Russia has the most nuclear weapons, but in terms of deployed warheads, we have the most. And you can see a number of smaller countries down there, China's way down the list. This is as of 
2021. So they have very little nuclear capability. But what's concerning our defense planners is that China is planning to expand their nuclear arsenal and putting in 1,500 warheads by 2035. And the reason they're doing that is we can, up to now, if they were misbehave, we could threaten them with nuclear attack. And if a little while, they'd be able to threaten us with nuclear attack. So it's basically uh, mutual assured destruction, which is a way to keep everybody not using these weapons. But that's why they're investing all this money in this nuclear te uh, weapon technology. But right now, again, we're much further ahead. But if you look at it from a Chinese perspective, we're perspective, we're kind of provocative, I think. Um, so how do we get here? How do we get into this problem with China? And I'm going to take you back in a little walk through history. I think most of you are my age or younger. Most of you are younger than me, I think. Uh, so, but we all can remember a couple, a couple incidents from long ago. And this is a picture at 1972 that at least I thought I would never see. That's uh, Richard Nixon, our president at the time, having dinner with Zhou Enlai. Zhou Enlai was the prime minister of Mao Zedong in China. And he was the uh, foreign minister. He was very highly respected in the world for his, his capabilities as a foreign minister. He studied in France. And here he's serving Richard Nixon at dinner. Richard Nixon, of course, got into power as, as a strong anti-communist fighter. And they came up with, Richard Nixon and, and uh, Henry Kissinger came up with the idea of a tilt to China. Why? The Chinese in the late 1960s had had a border war with Russia. I don't know if you remember that. But there are a number of border clashes. It was so severe and frightened the Chinese so much that they moved a number of their factories from the northern parts of China into the central part. One of them was a factory that we ended up having a joint venture, a place called Findingshan. That was originally located on northeast China near the Russian border. And they just picked the whole factory up and moved it to the center of China to, to get it out of range of Russian bombers. So this is the historical relationship between Russia and China. They have a lot of bad history between them. And our Nixon and Kissinger had the idea that China might need us as an offset to Russia. We also needed China as an offset to Russia. We were in a nuclear race with China and with Russia, and we were trying to figure out how to extricate ourselves from Vietnam. So the idea of having this tilt to China was, uh, was that we would help each other against the Russians, and help, they would help us get ourselves out of the mess in Vietnam. And so here you have uh, Nixon, sir, uh, Joe and Lai serving Nixon uh, dinner. Someone asked me at one of these presentations why the different chopsticks, and I'll just share that with you, it's kind of interesting in Chinese culture. Usually in China, everybody gets one set of, chops, one set of chopsticks, and there's lazy Susie serving the food, and you dip it in. There's no sanitation, everybody dips in their chopstick and helps themselves. But I guess for important guests, they would have a second set. These red ones are for serving, and the white ones are for, for the guests to eat with. So a little more hygienic. That's why they're different colors. And there's Richard Nixon with Mao Zedong. Who would ever think that we would have seen this? Remember, at least I was, as a young person, I was really surprised by this. Uh, and there's Richard and Pat Nixon touring the Great Wall. Everybody has to go to the Great Wall when they make their first trip to China. So that, was, that changed the world. But it also came with some diplomatic language that is relevant to, the, to today. There were three communiques between PRC, the People's Republic of China, and the United States. And the first one was between Nixon, was by the Nixon administration, signed by Henry Kissinger and Zhou Enlai. That's called the Shanghai Communique. There was a second one in 1979 between Jimmy Carter and Deng Xiaoping, the next big leader of China. And there was a third one between Ronald Reagan and Deng Xiaoping. The Shanghai Communique is really interesting. This was the price that Nixon had to pay for the dinner. He said, China has embedded the language in the communique that China, that Taiwan is China's internal affair and no other country has the right to interfere. And we signed this agreement. We, we put in the communique that uh, what diplomats call constructive ambiguity. All Chinese, we, we, Kissinger's language is all Chinese on either side of the Taiwan Strait maintain there's but one China and that Taiwan is part of China. So the Chinese signed that. And we also said that we're interested in a peaceful settlement of the Taiwan question by the Chinese themselves. The second communique was by Jimmy Carter. 
things have gotten friendlier between the United States and China. And the man, the man standing next to him is Deng Xiaoping. Has anybody heard of Deng Xiaoping? He's quite revered in China today. As, he was a strident communist, a contemporary of Zhou Enlai, also studied in France when he was a young person. And uh, he, 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 after the Cultural Revolution, he was brutalized in the Cultural Revolution. And he reformed his ways and suddenly realized that he had to, that we, the forward, path forward for China was to modernize the economy. And that was to make good relations with the United States. So the two of them made a deal in 1979 where we established diplomatic relations with China. We ended our recognition of Taiwan, the Republic of China, that's what ROC stands for. All military personnel were withdrawn from China, and we canceled the defense treaty with China, with Taiwan. So that was a pretty big victory for, for, the, uh, for the Chinese. The Congress didn't like that. There's a thing, they, they passed the Taiwan Relations Act, which basically said we would defend Taiwan. So the Congress didn't, didn't go along with Carter, but nevertheless, this was the communique and the official way things were going to be. We set up the American Institute of Taiwan. This is like an embassy in Taiwan, but it's not an embassy. Anybody in the Foreign Service who works there has to retire from the Foreign Service. That They do provide consular services. I was there once on an economic dispute we were having in Taiwan, and they helped us resolve that. So it looks like an embassy, but it's not an embassy. It's the Institute, American Institute of Taiwan. We don't have diplomatic relations with Taiwan. Uh, the third one was Ronald Reagan and Nancy Reagan. They had their trip to the Great Wall. I, I always admire how well-dressed the two of them are. Um, deliberately ambiguous statements. U.S. officials described arms sales to Taiwan would be reduced based on PRC's peaceful uh, policy towards Taiwan. So again, we're saying if you have peaceful reunification, we're all for it. But we don't want you to have military, uh, forced military uh, reunification. The PRC officials focus on the provisions that we said that U.S. would respect sovereignty and gradually reduce arms sales to Taiwan. So that was, again, all these things had some language for both sides. And, and it really wasn't an issue because the Chinese really didn't have the capability to attack Taiwan. Their economy was in ruins. They were trying to fix up their economy. And things went along pretty smoothly between the two countries in retrospect, at least compared to, the, to today until the Tiananmen incident. And we all probably remember that in 1989. And we were shocked by that, how the communists sent their army in to destroy, break up the demonstrations. And no one really knows how many people were killed in this demonstration. Uh, this is a um, famous picture. They call this guy Tankman. The guy stood in front of the tanks blocking them from going into, that's called Chang'an J, which means Long Peace Street, the big boulevard going into the main downtown, downtown uh, Beijing. And, uh, but the lesson from this, an important lesson to remember, is after everything was said and done, Deng Xiaoping had the number one priority to preserve the rule of the Communist Party in China. This was the number one message. It's the number one message then. It's the number one message now. They will do whatever it takes to keep themselves in power, including killing a lot of their students. There's a lot of bitterness in China among high officials that I met about what happened here in 1989 times when they were a little more confident, trusting in me, they would kind of let down their guard and tell me that. So a lot of anger about what happened here. Uh, but this, this Tiananmen Square was forced, precipitated by a lot of frustration by people about the economy in China. They were frustrated that Deng Xiaoping was not opening the economy fast enough and that, and, and that there, was, there was a lot of inflation in China. And this is what led to the, the, the demonstrations in Tiananmen. And the response to uh, this was is that Deng Xiaoping realized he had to move a lot faster in opening the China economy. So he came up with a policy called Tao Guang Yang Wei. It's a Chinese uh, idiom. It goes back thousands of years. Remember, China's a country that's 4,000 years old. And the language of idioms from long ago, mostly military idioms that people use in daily conversations. I used to memorize a lot of them so I could use them in business was an effective way to communicate some of the ideas we were trying to do. So this Tao Guang Wei means uh, hide your strength and bide your time. Don't get your enemy alarmed. Let him become, not be worried about you so you can get strong and then deal with it later on. So Deng Xiaoping pushed back any confrontation over Taiwan till later, after he died. Unfortunately, later is getting closer to now. 
He lived to 1997. He's regarded as a really great man in China. The big, big, huge posters of him when I was leaving China, talking about his southern tour. He made a tour uh, after Tiananmen Square where he talked about getting rich was, was a good thing. So, um, which is a real change from, from his youth as a communist. Um, and they credit him with the big development of China. So they, they were moving in the late 90s to join the World Trade Organization, and they were accepted in, 19, in 2001. There was a lot of excitement when China was accepted in the WTO. This is when the big trade deficits started developing between the United States and China, and between China and the rest of the world. And their economy grew after they joined the WTO at a rate of 15% per year of the compound annual growth rate, which is really extraordinary. Ours is two or 3%. In good years, good times. So this resulted in really a revolution in China, a much higher standard of living. And you can see here that the poverty rate, and we, we witnessed this among young people, the poverty rate went down, the, the annual income went way up, and this is always, this is during the time we were involved with China. This huge change in benefit for the Chinese people. And diplomats, whether it was Nixon, uh, Carter, Reagan, Bush, Everybody talked about the peaceful rise of China. The assumption was that if they get wealth, they have more to lose, and they won't be looking at military adventures. That was the assumption of all, of all our presidents and, and everybody. That was the arguments. And this, um, then this guy came along in 2012. And you probably recognize this picture of Xi Jinping. It's an excise graph Xi. And he came up, proclaimed when he became his first term in office, he just was elected, as you know, to a third term in office or five-year terms. When he got to his first term in office, he said the Chinese nation has, has ushered in a great leap from standing up. Where did I use that word standing up? Early in the presentation, Mao Zedong said the Chinese people have stood up to getting rich. Who said it was okay to get rich? Deng Xiaoping, right and becoming strong. That's what, so Xi Jinping's point was, he was gonna say, we're gonna become strong now. And the great rejuvenation of the Chinese nation has entered in an irreversible historical process. Rejuvenation of the Chinese nation. What do you think that means? Well, I'll give you my idea what it means. It means this map. This map is from 1820. This shows the maximum expansion of the Qing Empire. Q-I-N-G is pronounced Qing. You know them from the last emperor. Many of you saw the movie, The Last Emperor, the end of the Manchu dynasties. Well, the correct name is the Qing dynasty, Q-I-N-G. And this is the maximum expansion of the Qing Empire. And the Manchus came from Manchuria. And in 1643, they crossed the Great Wall and came into Beijing and quickly expanded to southern China. A few years later, in the late 1600s, they occupied Taiwan, and then the late 1600s and 1700s, they next Outer Mongolia, Xinjiang, and Tibet. They also made Korea a tributary state. Korea was, was not a separate country, but it was in a tributary relationship with the Qing dynasty at that time. Even Okinawa, way out here, was in a tributary relationship to the Qing dynasty. And Southeast Asia, all these countries were in a tributary relationship to the Qing dynasty. So that's what, that's what rejuvenation of the Chinese nation means to, to Xi Jinping. This is a re restoration of the original Chinese empire, which leads into now this concept of sphere of influence and potential conflicts with the United States because he's getting into our territory, our empire. I think it's the only way to look at it is our empire. So this immediately is where the claim for what's called the first island chain exists. And the first island chain is islands like Japan and Taiwan, Philippines. These are islands that are off the coast of Asia. And so they're claiming all the water within the first island chain. And it's and, and, uh, all the way down into Malaysia and Singapore, and this is the South China Sea. So that's their, what they're claiming. And um, the problem is, there's somebody already there. That's us. These are all our bases that are out there. We have huge military assets in Japan. We have huge military assets in Japan. 
We have uh, Okinawa, big naval bases in Okinawa. We have, we have naval bases in, in Guam, wherever Guam is on this map. And we have, we have big bases, some bases in the Philippines, bases in Australia, and bases in Southeast Asia, all there to prevent the expansion of the Chinese Empire. So this is what's leading to the clash between our, the two empires in these two overlapping sphere of influence claims. Well, the first thing the Chinese did, and they did this when we were living in China, in 2010, they started printing passports for all Chinese travelers. The map on the inside of the passport was what's called the nine dash line. The nine dash line are these lines right here that, that claim everything within this is part of China. And that was on, every, on tourist passports. And that infuriated the Vietnamese. They had big posters on ours in Vietnam uh, uh, complaining about Chinese intervention. That infuriated the people in the Philippines. And, and pretty soon all these countries in Southeast Asia said, if you're gonna have that on your passport, we're not letting you in. So anybody who showed up with a nine dash line passport had to go back home. They were not allowed to enter the country. Then they started uh, making claims to these islands in the center, like the Spratly Island, and the Scarborough Shoal. They're important because there's a lot of oil and gas resources in the South China Sea. The South China Sea is the most heavily uh, navigated shipping route in the world. All the trade between China and the rest of the world passes through there. There's a lot of fisheries there that are being contested by the Chinese, particularly with the Philippines. Then they started militarizing bases in the South China Sea, coral reefs. They started reclaiming the coral reefs putting sand, sand into them to raise the elevation, building air, airport uh, jet fighter uh, airstrips there, putting in um, radar and missile installations. The United States challenged them about what they were doing. They put, oh, we're not militarizing them. And a year later, they were militarized. So, uh, this is this is very, very, very serious. They then declared this is our territory. The United States started sending freedom of navigation operations. Maybe you've heard of them. They send ships by these islands just to, to say, assert that these are, this is international territory. And so far the Chinese have not retaliated or not responded and prevented us from doing that. We've had airplanes fly over these islands. But this is, a, this is really the flashpoint between the United States and China right now is in the South China Sea. The Philippines took China to court over these claims. The Philippines is actually a pretty weak nation. They expelled us from, from the, the uh, from our bases in the Philippines in the, I think in the early 2000s, and like Subic Bay, we were asked to leave maybe late 90s, but now they want us to come back as a, as a buffer against, against the Chinese. The Philippines were in no position to contest with the Chinese intervention against their fishing rights. They took China to the World International Court of Maritime Law. The Chinese lost the lawsuit and they ignored it. And then Duterte became the new leader of the Philippines, who's kind of a wild card, and he decided to make deals with the Chinese and to uh, rather than to try to enforce this agreement because he had no capability to enforce the, the world court ruling. Now there's a new ruler in the Philippines, uh, Ferdinand Marcos, the son of the ruler of the Philippines, and there's more of an alignment with the United States, as you'll see in the next couple slides. But this is a very, very tense standoff between the United States and China right here. Um, so China then started economic outreach, which you probably heard about. Um, have you heard about the Belt and Road Initiative? Does that mean anything to anybody? No. Okay. It's called, in Chinese, it's called Yi Dai Yi Lu, One Belt, One Road. And when we were living there, we were, we were puzzled because this is going on during the time we were there. But they started building um, uh, railroad links across the old Silk Road routes to into, into Turkey and, and Syria, uh, and all the way into, through Russia and into, into Europe. Then they started building um, uh, sea routes. They called this a, neck, a pearl necklace of ports. This is the old British maritime routes. They put a port in Sri Lanka. They even poured a port in, in Somalia, right next to our major air base that we're using in our anti-terrorism war. The airstrips are adjacent. Somalia said, so you want to buy some land? We'll, we'll lease you an airport right next to the American airport. So they're, they've really expanded all over this area and they've, they've poured in a lot of money and huge amounts of loans outside of China for infrastructure uh, construction. And our company, like other companies in China, participated. If you were manufacturing products in China, you could sell products against these loans. Very similar to 
when I started my career, we used to sell our products through AID, American International Development Fund. They were funded by the gov our government for the same, same reason, to build friendships around the world. And now the Chinese are doing it with Belt and Road. And this is what I would call a global projection of power and influence. And the biggest one, I showed this slide, I think when we talked in 2021, was it we were here? We, this is a slide from 2021, not much has changed. Enormous amount of investment in Africa, $143 billion in, in infrastructure projects. Some of the projects we, my own company, supplied from China. And um, the, the Chinese are very well liked in Africa because they don't come with any strings attached. They're not, in, they're not dictating what kind of government should be there. They're not dictating any Chinese morality that should be there. No lectures about uh, human rights or, or, or corruption. And they just have been spreading money all over Africa and buying friendships. The Africans don't like the Europeans because of the legacy of colonialism in Africa. And uh, our country's really not been interested in Africa until recently, and only recently as a response to this. Janet Yellen was in Africa, if you remember, last month, uh, trying to promote more American involvement in Africa. The, set, the other initiative was on technology. The Chinese decided that they were gonna be number one in the world key technologies, and, that, and Doug, uh, Xi Jinping initiated this Made in China 2025, and that, that they would be the leader in 10 technical areas, including artificial intelligence, new materials, biopharmaceuticals, robotics, clean energy, aviation, and telecommunications. They're the leaders in facial recognition. They've mastered it. They've got cameras all over the place, all over China. They can, can see your face and, and identify who you are, where you're going, and where you've been. So this is kind of scary to American companies because we don't really have government controlled technology development. We, we have kind of free, free willing competition. But they're moving very quickly in this area. They have what these, what's called design institutes that specialize in them. So for example, there's several, I'm in the power engineering field, there's several power engineering design institutes and in the area of, of high voltage transmission, they've become the leader in the world in some of these technologies. Same with railroads. They built modern railroad uh, projects all over China, but they required the Europeans to, to share the technology and they've taken it and taken it uh, advanced and now they're suddenly competitors of people who were formerly investing in China. So it's, it's, a, it's a challenging situation to the United States because in the long run, it's ever the leader in these areas is gonna come out on top in any kind of global competition, which we are in. I think I gave it to you that we're all in, in global competition. I hope I didn't interfere with your sleep tonight, but anyway. <laughs> uh, the Chinese also started looking out in the South Pacific. The South Pacific is where America fought the Japanese in the Second World War. And this is to threaten Australia. They started making uh, deals in, in the Solomon Islands with different countries uh, uh, to, to set bases up here and, and economics. And this really alarmed the Australians because the Chinese and China and Australia are in a very tense relationship these days. And then there's the Hong Kong National Security Law. We all know about the big demonstrations in Hong Kong. Uh, Margaret Thatcher and Deng Xiaoping negotiated that Hong Kong would be part of China, would be one country, but two, politi two political systems. Well, that ended in 2020 with this uh, national security law. The demonstrators are either in jail or they left the country and everybody's behaving themselves and China's running the show. It's not clear what the long-term future of Hong Kong is going to be. Then in Taiwan, China continues to challenge Taiwan and testing their defense capabilities, threatening flying, uh, flights into Taiwan. Meanwhile, Taiwan, especially after Hong Kong, they elected a, a, a political party called the Dem Democratic Progressive Party, DPP. That's the new ruling party in Taiwan, which asserts that Taiwan is not part of China, that Taiwan is an independent country. And our fear is that Taiwan is going to declare independence and that would precipitate an immediate war with China. So up to recently, we were telling Taiwan, yeah, we might defend you, we might not. We get this idea of strategic ambiguity. We wanted the Taiwan, Taiwan to be not completely confident that we had their back, because we didn't want to force this into a war. Uh, but that changed this summer. As you know, Nancy Pelosi went to Taiwan in June. Nancy Pelosi was the uh, 
Speaker of the House, since it's really the number three position in U.S. government. It's an incredibly prestigious position to be Speaker of the House. And she goes to Taiwan, and that really upset the Chinese. Xi Jinping actually called uh, uh, Biden and said, please tell her not to tell, stop her from coming. I think Biden said something like, uh, who's going to tell Nancy Pelosi what to do? <laughs> <laughs> so she went. And a day after she left, the Chinese completely encircled the island with live fire military exercises, both naval and air. That's what's shown with these pink boxes. There are six different live fire zones around the island. Previous live fire ex exercises only went to the Taiwan Median Strait. There were some live fire exercises in 1996. So this uh, was designed to really intimidate the people in Taiwan. So I called up some of my friends in Taiwan. How are you guys doing? And are you worried with the Chinese? Nah, we're not worried. They didn't even really, they didn't feel any effect of all this. It's all over the headlines here, but they weren't worried. Their, their viewpoint was the Americans would protect them. That's where we have to decide great decisions, will we or not? Did you guys like iPhones or what? <laughs> well, then three times last year, Biden broke with historic convention with all these three Shanghai community, these three PRC USA communiques, and he said that the United States would defend China, China, Taiwan if China attacked. And each time, his staff walked back the comment and said he really didn't mean it. Then he would say it again. Uh, and after Pelosi's visit, the Senate approved a six and a half billion dollar military funding bill for Taiwan. The idea was to make, build up Taiwan's defensive capabilities. They, they call it a porcupine strategy, so it would be too prickly to, to, for the Chinese to grab. It's not so easy to do a, a, a sea invasion, but that's what they were. Uh, that, so we, we invested all this money in, in Taiwan to try to strengthen their, 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 and then we worked on economic response. So we had our response now. So the Chinese have been pushing, pushing in all these areas. Again, as I've told you in the first half of this presentation, now what did we do? For every action, there's a reaction. And that's my next couple slides that I'm going to introduce here. And the first one was last summer, the, the $280 billion bipartisan, nothing happens bipartisan in this country anymore, bipartisan chips bill. Everybody agreed that we had to invest in our capability to manufacture what's called thin wafer chips to make these, to power these phones. They're very advanced technology. The only company that makes the chips that go in this phone is a company called Taiwan Semiconductor Manufacturing Company, TSMC. They are the leader in the world in this technology. The United States has fallen behind. The Chinese only assemble these phones. They don't make what goes in it. They assemble the stuff. The, the brains of this phone is made in Taiwan. And so we want to get that capability in the United States. So we passed uh, this law. To, to, so here you, know, you see government-directed investment. So what are what the Chinese are doing towards getting this capability. Uh, Intel announced that they were going to build a big uh, factory in Ohio. Last summer, uh, uh, Micron announced that they're going to build a big factory in Syracuse. And they're talking about one of the Syracuse is like $39 billion. This one here is $20 billion in chip making to have, bring the manufacturing back into the United States to manufacture the most advanced chips. Then we've gone to people who supply the equipment to manufacture chips, leading companies, companies in the Netherlands, to make special lithographic equipment to photo etch these chips. And we prevented any of that equipment from being delivered to China. So we're putting a real squeeze on the Chinese and what technology can go into China. We then, uh, under the Trump administration, they really leaned on Huawei, trying to control what they were doing and what chips they could get. And Biden kept all those uh, restrictions in place, and now in the last week, Washington halted all licenses for U.S. companies to export to Huawei. So as I'm putting this together, I'm saying, this thing's really kind of heating up. Uh, and uh, then there's a military response. What's been our military response? You probably, it's not so much in the news right now, but there's a, uh, a, a um, alliance in Asia between the United States and, Asia, and Pacific countries called the Quad. The Quad consists of Australia, 
India, Japan, and the United States. All of them have bad relations with China. Uh, when we were living in China, we used to buy, the, the stores were filled with wine from Australia, and the Australians criticized uh, China over, over COVID and a few other things, and they completely shut down buying goods from Australia. Um, they've been threatening with these bases in the Solomon Islands. India has had border clashes with China, and they're also in the Indian Sea, in the Indian, sea Indian Ocean. And of course, Japan has been very threatened by China. So this, this quad has been re-energized, it's an old alliance that's been re-energized to oppose the Chinese. And other countries are, are partial members like, like uh, Canada, for example, and Germany and uh, other, other national company, countries. The second big uh, push was this AUKUS deal. Has anybody heard of this? This is Australia, United Kingdom, that's the UK, United States. And Fran the French had a deal to sell diesel powered submarines to Australia. And secretly, the United States and, and the Australians and the United Kingdom negotiated to replace that deal, kick the French out, our allies, which infuriated the French, that the Australians would buy nuclear powered submarines using technology the United States and England had developed. And this became known as the Alcus deal. And this, you know, then the, the submarines are going to be based in Perth, in Western Australia. The nuclear submarines are going to be deployed off the coast of China. They can stay underwater for 71 days, and they're very hard to detect. A diesel-powered submarine cannot cannot uh, stay underwater, even, cannot even get that far, but it can, only, it can stay near Singapore underwater for 14 days, where a nuclear submarine could stay. Come on. So 14 days, and where a nuclear submarine could stay underwater for 74 days. So they're, they can stay on, on station, and they can't be uh, detected. So that's the whole idea of this deal. So this is really a big counter move to China's uh, threats uh, to the United States and Australia. We've also, at the end of last year, Congress also authorized an additional $10 million to beef up Taiwan's defenses. This is on top of everything we're doing in Ukraine. Japan, which has a constitution after World War II that declared pacifism in their constitution, that they would not be a military country, they're now rearming. They've committed to, to spend 2% of their budget on national defense, and they're rearming to, to ward off the Chinese and the North Koreans, both of which have been threatening the Japanese islands. Last week, or the week, two weeks ago, Lloyd Austin, our Secretary of Defense, was in the Philippines, and uh, the Philippines agreed to, to lease us four, let us use four bases. And the northern Philippines is less than 100 miles from Taiwan. So again, this has alarmed the Chinese, but they brought it on themselves. They brought it on themselves. Um, in, the, in the Solomon Islands, we put a lot of investment now there to, uh, to counter the Chinese influence. There's been enormous pressure. And this woman on the right is Wendy Sherman. She's a very important person in the State Department. She's the Under Secretary of State. And she went there, and I didn't realize this until I was preparing this slide. She went there with Carolyn Kennedy, John Kennedy's daughter. As you know, John Kennedy is a hero, PT-109 of the uh, World War II, where he saved his crew in the Solomon Islands, just to remind everybody of the commitment. Both their fathers, uh, Wendy Sherman's father and Carolyn Kennedy's father, were in World War II in, in the uh, Gua Battle of Guadalcanal. So um, we're pushing back hard and fast. Um, in Southeast Asia, we're putting money into Southeast Asia and investing more in there, our traditional allies that we've had relationships with going back to the Vietnam War. And then the article, so that's, that's our pushback. The next step is what about Russia? The book talks that it's a big threat, China having an alliance with Russia. I showed you how much more money China was investing in defense compared to Russia. And Russia's really a pretty small player, at least if you look at the numbers, other than their nuclear capability. Right before the Olympics last year, Putin went to Beijing for the Winter Olympics, the opening of the Winter Olympics. It's a big deal for the Chinese, but everybody boycotted them because of their behavior. And uh, they signed an agreement where they declared that Taiwan's part of China. Well, we agree with that. They oppose the AUKUS alliance. They, they agreed on that. They opposed NATO expansion, so that was something for Putin. Opposed US missile defense 
And there's a big one, U.S. global hegemony. That's referring to our, what I call our empire. And democracy. And the strength and cooperation in AI and IT. So this is what the author is talking about. He's saying that this is a threat to, to the United States. So I think China is a weak partner in this deal. And that was kind of demonstrated by, uh, by the war in Ukraine that uh, Putin didn't do very well in Ukraine, or hasn't done very well at least so far. I think it's been kind of a surprise to all of us how poorly his armies have performed there. So he's not very considered, doesn't look like such a strong partner. The Russians are desperate for outlets to sell their natural gas. The Chinese are great negotiators. They've extort, ex, got extremely good deals on low prices of natural gas coming into, into China from Russia. They, the other thing is that China is very careful. They don't want anybody country to say, like the United Nations to come and say, Tibet should be independent or Xinjiang should be independent. They're very opposed to that. So they, they um, don't want to intervene in other, other countries' affairs. So they have not supported Russia on the annexation of, of Crimea. They have not recognized Crimea as part of Russia. Just one example of this. So it's, it's not such a stable alliance. So I keep wondering when this author wrote this paper, because it's really contemporary. But Beijing believes they have three big advantages. They have the world's largest navy, but when you compare the important ships in the navy, here's another table from the Financial Times. You know, China has two aircraft carriers, we have 11. China has 78 battle destroyers and frigates, we have 113. They have six nuclear submarines, we have 14, and so on. We have a lot more uh, resources than they do, at least on paper. So again, they're trying to change this, but this, they, they're certainly aware of our capabilities, and this is why they're trying to rearm. China does have geographic proximity to Southeast Asia. They've built a high-speed railroad from in uh, Southeast China, uh, Southwest China, from Kunming and Yunnan province to into Laos, and could all the way to Taiwan to Thailand if that's necessary. And they're doing a lot more trade in Southeast Asia than we are, so they do have advantages there. So we have two competing visions for the future. One is containing China, which is what the article talks about, which is really what we're trying to do, contain it. It's going to come at a heavy price. And the second one is China's vision. This is, this is a quote from Anthony Blinken last May. China has the ambition to create a sphere of influence. There's another word coming from again. Uh, in Indochina and become the world's leading power. They talk a lot. We've, told, we've talked about the first island chain right here, but China's talking about a second island chain that goes all the way out to Guam, where we have one of our major Pacific bases that they want to include in their sphere of influence. So for sure during my lifetime, this is going to be a big thing in the news. This is not going to go away. This is a, the big challenge of, of probably of our children's generation. And we'll see. So I was getting this whole thing done, and then suddenly, last middle of last week or something, this headline appears, Blinken is going to China. I went, ah, that's great. Maybe things will loosen up and we can uh, stabilize this relationship. And then uh, over the weekend, I had one, one, one more picture to my slideshow, <laughs> the spy balloon. So our relationship's on ice again. And uh, stay tuned. I'll probably have to update this presentation a few more times when I give it in Cedarburg. Now, a couple books. Jennifer's done some research. Maybe she can tell you about them. But just quickly, there are four books here that are good on this subject. Since we're in a library, we want to advertise the library. Uh, this book, Destined for War, which came out a couple years ago. Graham Allison's with Harvard Strategic Studies School. It's, it's a book talking about what he calls the Thucydides Trap, that a rising power uh, has historically always gotten into a war with the incumbent power. Referring back to the Peloponnesian Wars, that's where the Thucydides trap is. A more, more recent example is Germany challenging England. And Germany was a rising power, they challenged England, we had two world wars out of it. So he's asserting that we're in the same situation that China is challenging the United States and we're a rising power. This book is in the library, right? Mm -hmm. this book it's on my desk right now if anybody wants it. <laughs> All right. The second one is Danger Zone. This is written by the uh, John Hopkins guys, the same, guy, the same program that the other, um, that the author of the Foreign Policy article wrote, different people, but the same, I'm sure more of the same thinking. And I read this last, last year, last, late last summer, last, last fall, I guess I read it, just came out. And they, they say maybe it's possible to avoid a war, which Graham Allison is more pessimistic. 
And they talk about all the things the United States could do, like boycotting all kinds of technology, all the things that you see happening. It's amazing to me, everything I read in the book last fall has been implemented since I read the book, or at least that's the direction it's going. Uh, third one, this bottom one, is a man named Kevin Run, Rudd. He's an interesting guy. He was the Prime Minister of Austra Australia, and he, um, he uh, later, he's a fluent Mandarin speaker. He studied as a, as a student in China and has had many direct one on one conversations with Xi Jinping. He was president of the Asia Society in San Francisco or New York, I forget where it is. And most recently, he was appointed as the ambassador from Australia to the United States because he's been in the Labor Party in Australia. So he has uh, written a book called The Avoidable War. He talks about 10 circles as his analogy of where there could be potential conflict. So if you're interested, that's another good book to read. And finally, I haven't read this last book, The Chip War. It's, uh, I guess there's a long line of people waiting to, to get this book out of the library, including me. And uh, this is about the, uh, the competition in integrated circuit technology that's going on today. So these are four good books if you want to read up on the Chinese competition. If you're not a real kind of heavy reading, read them in the morning rather than before bed. So um, these are the questions from uh, the Great Decisions book. I think these are important questions. What should our policy be towards Taiwan and one China policy? Are we willing to go to war over China, over Taiwan? You know, this, is, this is our unresolved civil war, the same unresolved civil war between North and South Korea that are potentially drag, dragging us into very serious conflicts. Can we work with China on global and foreign policy issues like climate change in North Korea? Is it possible to work with China to limit uh, Russia's aggression in Ukraine? Should we expand our multilateral trade alliances? I really didn't emphasize this, but if you recall when, when President Trump came into office, he canceled all our multilateral alliances, like the Trans-Pacific Agreement. Uh, Biden quickly implemented a multilateral strategy to get all the countries working together to block China rather than, rather than have us be separate. I think the, Biden, the Chinese are much more fearful of Biden's strategy than, 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 than China, than the Trump strategy. Uh, but this is like, you know, the question is, do you want it? Do you believe in multilateral alliances or not? That's what's going on right now. Uh, should we, uh, how serious a threat is the China-Russia alliance? I, I gave you my opinion, I think. But those are all questions in the briefing book at the end of the article. And I think that's it. So we have any questions? Or I'll turn it over to Jennifer. Yeah, I just wanted to mention all four of those books are in the system. One of them's on my desk, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's time for questions. In your 10 years in China, what's your gut feel about trusting the Chinese people, the, the uh, companies there, the politicians. Keep your hands in your pocket. <laughs> uh, that's a, that's, it's hard to generalize. We had wonderful, really, I had a great team in China. By the time I left, there were over 2,000 people in our organization. Mm -hmm. um, had great relationships with people. But you know, Chinese business is very competitive and very tricky, and there's a, it's a different way of doing business in the United States. Um, they're very patriotic. They're very proud of China's rise. The young people are very proud of what, they, what, China, what China's achieved. Okay. They're aware of the his, histories in their family, the, of the, tr the trauma, the persecutions of the Cultural Revolution and the Great Leap Forward. Um, they want, you know, they, they delight when China gets one up on the United States. I did mention to you the 2001 downing of an American spy plane on Hainan Island. Is anybody aware of that? I hear somebody want this. We, we regularly uh, patrol the China coast with spy planes and they sent a jet fighter out in 2001 and forced, basically there was a collision between the two planes. The Chinese pilot was killed and uh, the, our plane made an emergency landing on Hainan Island. And that's an island in the south of China. And um, the Chinese, that's where they think the balloon originated from, Hainan Island. And the, uh, Chi the Chinese, Eventually, there was a big standoff between George Bush and John Kimmel, the president of China at the time. And eventually, the uh, uh, our crew, it was like ten or fifteen people in the crew, it was, it was a listening plane. They were released, and when the plane was taken apart, eventually returned to the United States several years later in a bunch of crates. Gave the homage. 
So it's a, something to think about for today because we're taking apart their balloon right now. And the Chinese went back and we said we're not going to return it. So I think everybody has interest, and you, I don't think it matters whether you can trust people or not. I don't think that the people want to go to war with the United States. They like Americans, but they're also nationalists and can easily be manipulated just like we can. So. Um, are U.S. companies still growing in China? Are they um, trying to pull back and bring things back to the, our country or other parts well, of the our, world? Our company is one example. I think it's not unusual. We, we local, first of all, Chinese market standards. So I had trouble getting my colleagues in the United States to understand the, thing, the, the, the standards for making products are very different in China. Than they are in the United States. So what we make here in the United States, they don't want to. They can't buy. They can't use it. It's like you know, it's the, like the plugs in different countries are different. It's the same thing with these products. So they, we we localize all our products. And we're making products in China in Chinese supply chain for Chinese customers, but also for export to Europe. Um, I think I think the sourcing part is pulling back people sourcing product from China. That's what this all these chip investments are. So. So I don't, I don't think it's been that great a change from what I understand. People are continuing to do what they were. Everybody's working towards, towards the ability to localize and not import, because you couldn't compete if you're importing. Thanks. Thank you. I heard there were rolling power blackouts in China. Uh, and you're a power company. Do you have any insight on that? Yeah, rolling blackouts in China is a regular feature because the power consumption is uh, expanding maybe even 20% per year consumption of electricity and they, they just can't keep up with it. So when there's heat waves, they would, for example, my factories, they would tell us, you have to shut down this week, this last week in July, we're not, you're not gonna have any electricity. They would schedule blackouts. So, and, and if there is a drought recently in the Yangtze River, which affected the output of Three Gorges Dam, which would be a significant uh, reduction in power. How do you feel about globalization? Do you feel it's, uh par for the course, or is it improving, or is it uh, stuff, uh, is it shrinking in terms of, you know, supply chains sourced outside of the United States? So I don't know if everybody heard the question is, how do I feel about globalization? That's really a difficult question for me because I'm somebody who spent my entire life working on globalizing. <laughs> and now, you know, it's out of favor. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a difficult question for me. I, you know, I, Theoretically, I believe in it, but it's come at you know, hardship, tremendous hardship costs for some of the U.S. factories, and it's been an unfair playing field. Uh, it caused a lot of pain and political, and a lot of the politics we're experiencing today are a result of the pain some people have experienced because of globalization. So I think there has to be a balance. In theory, it, it should be good for everybody. It certainly was good for the Chinese. You know, if you can, I forget the slide I showed you. How many people? I said 500 million people have their standard of living list lifted. Overall, isn't that? A, I think that's a good thing. They're less likely to want to go to war. They have less war to lose. So, but I'm an idealist. Yes, sir. What do you think about that uh, weather balloon or spy balloon? Uh, <laughs> if they picked it up in in Alaska, why didn't they shoot it down a lot sooner than you know out in Carolina? Well, first of all, I don't know the answer to the question. What I've read is that they were, you know, they were monitoring what it was doing. They could monitor its communications. It was useful for them to to learn what it was doing because it wasn't the first balloon that's come across there. It was the first one that everybody was aware of. So, I like to believe that our government knows what they're doing. I don't know if they do or not. I think it was a slow news week. That's why it was so, you know, big. Yeah. Yes, sir. What? Is, is the Communist Party as secure as it projects itself to be? So the question is, is the Communist Party as secure as it projects itself to be? I think the, the very what, The reason, can, can everyone hear me? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. Thank you. The reason I ask that is, it has this paranoia when you think about it. it, it initially was secure prior to uh, Tiananmen Square. Tiananmen Square was a tip, almost a tipping point. Yes. They then 
you're confident enough to allow the two, country, uh, two economic systems, two different ways of governing up to a certain point to Macau and Hong Kong. That sent a message to Taiwan. We can make this work. And then in 2020, the uh, whole Hong Kong situation is real. It was getting worse before that because the Democratic Progressive Party took power in Taiwan in 2016. They're in the second term now. So they were, since Xi Jinping, everybody's become very uneasy about it. Exactly. And the extent that they're going, that they feel threatened also with the Uyghurs and the internal security apparatus, is this a secure party or are they worried about internal dissent? Are they worried about the rising middle class wanting a different vision? I think you're. I think you're, you answered your own question. I think they are worried about that. Uh, you, you know, you're probably aware of the multiple demonstrations against the zero COVID policy that yes. spread out all over China. I didn't include a map of that in here. I was trying to keep this getting too long. But you know, if you, the protest map looks exactly like the map of 1911, when there was all demonstrations against the Qing Dynasty. That overthrew it. They were very worried about that. The other thing is, we see China, the Communist Party is monolithic. It's not monolithic. There's a lot of different factions in it that are gaining for power. In this last Chinese last party meeting, Xi Jinping got all his guys in. I was at a dinner, went to a wedding in somewhere in China during the anti corruption campaign. If you've heard about that. And I got invited to the wedding of this business partner of mine, his daughter. And, um, just amazing. It was just, it's all local people. I didn't see any, any government officials. So this is in a big hotel. He said, weddings are a big deal in China, like big Hollywood productions. And suddenly I got pulled out of the room and they said, they took me to a side elevator. This is during the anti-corruption campaign where everybody's supposed to not, not be partying away. And they took me up to this secret elevator on the side of the building up to a, a, a dining room at the very top of the hotel packed with all the guys I knew. I knew all of these guys, the governor of Ningbo. It's a big position. That's where Xi Jinping got his start. And uh, these guys were all very drunk, which is a good thing. China, Chinese like to drink a lot, and eating all kinds of exotic seafood, and complaining about Xi Jinping's anti-corruption policy to this American guy. I understood enough Chinese that I could talk to them. So it's not, it's not unilateral. You know, they're united against the United States, against the colonial vision, and that, that can get everybody united. But there, there's a lot of people losers in all of this, and they're angry and hurt by it. So does that also account for some of that aggressive foreign policy, uh, the world strategy? Uh, because some of the movement does, doesn't make much sense. Which doesn't make much sense? Some of their aggressive foreign policy, at least right now, and militarily, they're still not quite strong enough. So you can uh -huh. bluff as much as you want. Yeah. But they're still not quite capable of doing right. it without cutting their economic throat, which would lead to internal dissent. Which you could argue maybe is happening now. Um, what is, you know, we're, we're pushing back now economically really hard. To constrain, let, let blocking any new technology from going into China, militarizing the whole the whole first island chain to prevent them from expanding into it. So they have cut their own throats. Joan and I were, Joan was friends with the um, the uh, U.S. Consul, consulate uh, general, the consul general's wife in Shanghai. We got invited to a party there. And I still remember that there was this Chinese person there, sitting next to the consul general complaining how dumb his government was. I think he probably was drinking too much. I just wonder who, what spies were there listening to him and what, what happened to him afterwards. Because he was saying how dumb their policy was in the South China Sea. To, and it did so blatantly in front of everybody. So, I don't know. I, 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 think, I think the law, you know, we have a, a disciplined policy and, and it's not politicized. We get consistent from administration to administration. We, we'll be fine. Yes, sir. Yeah, it's uh, it should the Chinese choose to retake control of Taiwan. Do you feel that a, a blockade would be a more effective solution than a military solution? Blockade is a military. Chinese would blockade us. Uh, you mean if the Chinese blockade Taiwan? 
Or us blockade China? Oh, no, the, the Chinese blockade Taiwan. Well, that would be interesting to see what, that's what they're threatening to do, and that's what this last episode was to simulate, that that's what they were doing. Um, I, I'm not a military person, I just read lots of books. Uh, I like libraries, so. Um, <laughs> The, um, during the Chinese Civil War in 1949, I didn't really point it out, but I could go back to that slide if you want to wait a second. Your islands off of Xiamen, within two miles of Xiamen, that's on the coast of China in Fujian province, that are still controlled by Taiwan, by the nationalist Chinese. And during the Civil War, the Chinese, uh, the Chinese tried to uh, attack these islands and they failed it miserably in the amphibious landings. They succeeded in, in uh, I could recommend a lot more books, but uh, anyway, kind of more about the history of China. It's shown in this map, I just didn't point it out. See those little green dots right here? These green dots right here, this is, these are Kingman, Matsu, I forget the name. All these four islands are controlled by the nationalists. When my Chinese, my employees went home for the Chinese New Year, they opened up direct flights between Shanghai and Taipei, but they're very expensive. So they would fly to Xiamen and take a ferry to Kingman, which they, you can see from the mainland, and then take a domestic flight to Taipei. That was cheaper than a direct flight from Shanghai. It's still there. Now it's kind of a tourist trap. But during during the, the cruise ship era, cruise ship visited Taiwan, visited Beijing, and Mao wanted to embarrass cruise ships, so he started shelling these islands to make the Americans think that the Russians were going to help them invade these islands. They're still there. Those four islands are still controlled by the national uh, the nationalists because it's very hard to do any amphibious landing. So you think the Russians are having trouble in Ukraine? The Chinese would have a lot more trouble in Taiwan. The only difference is I don't think the Taiwan, we, we spent a lot of time in Taiwan, we had factories in Taiwan. I don't think this, I'm not sure the Taiwan have the people, have the fight in them that the Ukrainian people do. That's the, the difference that I see. They may not want to want to fight and have their country destroyed. Because they've got, they're fat, dumb, and happy, and they think that we got their back. And maybe we do, maybe we don't. So I don't know, did I answer your question? Yes. Yeah, did I answer your question? I answered my question, yes. Okay, thank you. Good question. Not easy to do an amphibious invasion. That's the, that's the bottom line. Yes, sir? I think the uh, Taiwan Semiconductor was built, built in the mid front around Phoenix. Right? Yes, and, uh, yes. Huge, huge plant. Yeah, we can. And uh, don't you think at some point there's probably, there's going to be two technological systems, the communist system, either Russia or China, and a couple other countries? and the Russianized technological system. That's, that's what I think is going to happen. Quite possible. Yeah. The Chinese want to export to all these countries, though. They have a very commercial side. That's the conflict. That was really the point that the guy was trying to make in the difference between these, these two Cold Wars. Where is that slide? They're, they're different. The economic interdependence is quite substantial between our countries. So maybe we'll hopefully Mediate, ameliorate the situation. Yes, sir. It seems like a lot of the Chinese products over the years have been lower quality, just in general. Is, is there a push to make higher quality products, or do they not really care if you, if you sell them? Oh, well, they're, there's, they're, they're doing what's required of the market. They, they're investing an enormous amount of money. Like we used to import some of our raw materials to make some of our products, and the Chinese got the capability to do it, make it just as good inside China. So I, I think they're moving up the economic ladder. Certainly a lot of sophistication in some of the stuff they're doing. Yes? What was it like dealing with the Chinese legal system? That's an interesting question. What was it like dealing with the Chinese legal system? I was really pleasantly surprised that there is a legal system in China and it worked. Several times I got into lawsuits with Chinese companies and we actually prevailed. That was a surprise to me. We had good Chinese lawyers working for us they were really, they had a couple of these women, the women working for us, and they were really aggressive. And we sicked them on a couple of people that weren't paying us, and they paid. Courts forced them to pay. 
I agree. So, you know, you want to be careful. You let Chinese people do the fighting for you. Chinese against Chinese. Don't show up with an American lawyer in a Chinese court. Um, but I was surprised. Did you ever have to go and, after some of your conversations with political officials, did you ever have to go and tell anybody at the State Department uh, what was go, what you heard? Or, you know, they never called you up. Yeah, they never, never did. I know people that that happened to, they never came up to me. I was, I was dealing with in high, high tech areas, and also my strategy, I was, we were not introducing high tech products in China. In many cases, we were working with Chinese people to out compete other companies in China. So it's, we, we had a different strategy that I think really paid off. We ended up with a pretty big market share by the time we left. So we had a, this localization strategy that paid off. Yes, sir. You know, so in terms of their population, I keep hearing that there's like a demographic issue with like the number of kids that they have. And yeah, I have a that, slide of that bird in here, I think. Let's yeah. see. I, I, did it. I didn't put it in these, here. These issues, like with having to be aggressive to try to be distract populations or, you know, if they, they're worried about their own economics with what's going on with that population. I put a slide here. I, I, I think I took it out because I'm not sure if it's here or not. I'm going to take it out. It's like the one food policy. Yeah, here it is, right here. I have it. I, I hid the slide because I did, was, was afraid I would have too many slides. Let's see if I can unhide it. Pat, you and I talked ahead of time, so it means it looks good, right? <laughs> yeah, thank you. You're, that's the slide. Yeah. Can you see that? Yeah. And that's news earlier this year, or late last year. The population birth rate is to continue to decline. It's among the lowest birth rates in the world in China, which long term means that. And the, by the book, by the way, the book Danger Zone I think talks about that. You know, they're not. If they're going to have to do something, they're going to have to move pretty fast because they have declining population. It's aging population. It's a. It's really a result of two things. One is the one child policy which they eliminated three or four years ago. And, and that's also made more men than women. And the second thing is a rising economic standard. People don't want to have more than one, one child because it's very expensive to have a child. So um, that's resulted in this chart you see here. So that may mean that, that China in 10 years from now is going to be a weaker power than it is today. Yeah, you wonder how that all ties into what they're doing there. It's like, you know, do wars make better economic, you know, Opportunity. Well, danger, so zone, danger zone suggests that they may be feeling pressure if they're going to go for Taiwan. They're going to have to do it in the next couple of years. Yeah. That's what Danger Zone, the book Danger Zone suggests. So better read it. Jennifer's going to get better reserved for Jennifer. I can put it on hold for you. <laughs> Fair enough, Dan. Okay. So, Rick, do you support that in the three years? What's your feeling? I don't know. I, don't, I hope not. That's why I feel I hope not. I think they're fairly rational actors. The biggest danger is is somebody didn't make a mistake. Like this balloon thing. I don't think Xi Jinping said, well, we're gonna have to send this balloon across the United States and time it to be discovered by the time Anthony Blinken shows up in Beijing. I think more likely there was this program that he authorized some time back. These guys are doing their thing, they release the balloon, meanwhile Blinken's coming. I think this is a big embarrassment for Xi Jinping because he wanted to get his economy moving. He wanted to stabilize relations with the US. That's what I believe. On the other hand, if, if there's a collision between a, a two, two boats or, or two planes in the South China Sea, yeah. and someone pulls the trigger by mistake, that could blow up into something pretty big. That's probably the biggest danger. And that's what the, um, uh, the, the Thucydides trap book talks about, the first book, the Graham Allison book. Anything else here? I think we're some other, somebody else had any other questions or comments? Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, I wanted to mention, before you go, if you would do me a favor, there's some surveys. Short survey, four questions. Won't take much of your time, but if you could fill that out just to kind of inform us about how we did tonight and what you would like to see program-wise at the Franklin Public Library. So thank you for coming. And next week, we'll be here for a roundtable discussion. <coughs> um, the, the flyers over there. Um,
blanking out right now on the topic. But, so if you can join us, we, we'd love to have you. Thank you. More crimes. More crimes. More crimes. Thank you. More crimes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.